Right. Yes, now we are ready. Perfect. Excellent. And we have very good participation already. We have 21 people in the meeting and counting, so I think we should start. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this first verifiability talk. I think we can gradually say that uh, we, th this talk series is, is organized uh, in the context of a new project that will start as of 1st of November. It's a very large project with 17 senior researchers, nine postdocs, uh, uh, five universities. You can see the logos of universities perhaps behind me. Uh, the official start of the project is next month, well, in three weeks, two, three weeks, uh, 1st of November. Um, and one of the purposes of this uh, project is to build a community around verification and verifiability for autonomous systems. So um, uh, one of the first activities we are organizing is a talk series where we gather this community together. And, and, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the first speaker, Luis Venice. Luis has a lot of experience with uh, autonomous systems and different aspects of verification, but a very exciting aspect that uh, also uh, was one of the reasons we, we uh, have Manchester on board this project is verifying the ethical aspects of autonomous systems. And Luis will be exactly talking about that, that topic today. Luis, thank you very much for having accepted to talk and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, just, sorry, one, one, uh, uh, one organizational point. I'm recording this meeting. Please let me know if you have any objections. Uh, we would like to make this available later on to people who couldn't join online. So uh, this meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. So, so I'm Louise Dennis at the University of Manchester. Um, the work I've done in verifying machine ethics has actually been in collaboration with a load of other people, both at Manchester and other universities and I'll mention their names as we go through the talk when I mention stuff that I've done with them. So to start with, um, there's this question of what is machine ethics? And broadly speaking, um, this covers any way to make uh, computational reasoning of any kind ethical. But generally, the field has been split into what's called implicitly ethical computational reasoning and explicitly ethical. So I have here um, an example of something that you might consider to be um, implicitly ethical or perhaps implicitly unethical, um, and that is Facebook. Facebook does has some quite complicated algorithms in the back that um, determine what you actually get to see on your feed as it sort of scrolls past. And our assumption or our hope is that the people who program those algorithms and program that feed have done so in a way that what you get to see is, is ethical, so it doesn't um, misrepresent views or um, skew the discourse or conceal what people are actually talking about from you. As I say, a lot of people think that is absolutely not what's happening in Facebook, but the point is the algorithms themselves are not making judgments in which they, in some cases, explicitly represent the concept of what is ethical. Where I've tended to do most of my work is in what um, is generally labeled explicitly ethical machines. Um, and that is systems where it's assumed that the environment in which the machine is operating is sufficiently underspecified or dynamic that the machine itself is going to have to make judgments about what is the right or the wrong thing to do. Um, and the kind of classic example of um, explicit ethical machines are Asimov's laws of robotics. So all the robots in Asimov's robot stories have these three laws that are kind of hard coded into their um, reasoning. And I expect most of you are familiar with these. So the first law is that a robot may not injure a human being or through in action allow a human being to come to harm. The second law is that a robot must obey orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third law is that a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. And you can make an argument that A, Asimov made a career out of showing how these laws are actually not sufficient to give you ethical behaviour. Um, and also, I mean, a lot of machine ethicists feel that Asimov's laws of robotics are actually inadequate for what is wanted here. But there are a good example that everyone is familiar with, where in some sense we have explicitly set out in the programming of the robot 
what the rules are it has to be obey to to make it ethical and it has to make judgments about whether any of these laws come into play in any particular situation it's acting in. In terms of kind of more general theories of how you reason explicitly, we have at least 2000 years of philosophy about how to reason ethically. I don't really want to get into the details, the philosophical systems, but generally in machine, machine ethics, they get divided into three groups. The first represented by Socrates here is virtue ethics. Um, and in that sense, you decide what to do in an idea that it will somehow produce promote virtuous action and virtuous um, living. So it's, you know, is this an honourable thing to do? Is this a dignified thing to do? Is this a truthful thing to do? So you match it up against these kind of ideals or virtues. Um, the second group, and they're being represented here by Immanuel Kant, um, tends to be quite rule based. And there's a kind of concept that the virtue is inherent in the action itself. So there's things like do not kill it's the action of killing that has some ethical weight and often it's about the intention behind it so for instance there's a rule which oh i'm getting, I'm an, getting echo an echo there. there okay never mind there's a rule uh, which think, is called uh, the... some participants might not have muted their mark I, I muted one but please mute yourself thank you okay. so there's a um something called kant's categorical imperative where he says that you may not use someone as a means to an end so even if the end you've got is, is admirable, you can't use somebody who it doesn't benefit as part of achieving that. Um, and then representing um, what are called consequentialist theories. Here we have John Stuart Mill. And the idea is somehow the ethics of uh, an action rest in the consequences of the action. So you look at what the outcomes are like to, likely to be, and then you make a decision. Um, I'm sure you've noticed these are all um, white men from the Western tradition. There are a whole load of other traditions of ethical systems. Um, and one of the issues in machine ethics is, is exactly where are we getting our concept of ethics from? Again, I don't really want to go into that, but I was just sort of flagging that up. There are, when I first started doing machine ethics, there are three or four implementations of explicitly ethical agents. There are now, um, you know, kind of every time I look, another dozen papers have been published so what I'm putting up here is references to two survey papers um, on machine ethics. So since this is being recorded, I'm not going to say what they are, but if you're interested in pursuing the different ways people have chosen to implement explicit machine ethical reasoning, then um, Nallur's paper and Tolmeyer's paper are good places to look. So obviously you've got an implementation of ethical reasoning, explicit ethical reasoning. What do you want to prove about it? Um, and this is one of the problems you get into a lot if you're doing verification in autonomous systems is that you know what the end result is that you want to, to show, but it's not something you can formalize easily. So obviously what you want to prove is that your machine ethics system will always do the right thing. Um, and then you get to this problem that A, I've just talked about three broad categories of philosophical theory, and there's lots of theories within each of those categories. Um, so there's no agreement in uh, philosophy about what it means to do the right thing, especially at edge cases. Um, but what you do observe is that most, but not all of these systems have some set of rules or some set of utilities that is provided by stakeholders and these are given to a decision mechanism. So if you imagine utilitarianism, which is one of the most famous consequentialist theories, in that one you um, score all the outcomes of an action and then you pick the action which has the highest score. But these scorings of the utility of an outcome have to be provided in some sense in consultation with stakeholders. So you have some kind of ethical encoding that has been um, supplied by your stakeholders and then you plug that into the utilitarian decision mechanisms. And I put stakeholders in quotation marks again here. Again, one of the big issues in machine ethics is, is who are these stakeholders? Who is it that gets consulted and who is it does, does not get consulted? Again, a sort of separate issue, but I just want to sort of flag that up there. Um, so 
if you've got this kind of ethical coding, that gives you a kind of route into the things um, you might want to prove. Um, so this is something I actually managed to program up. Um, it was a smart home system that would not evacuate people in the event of a fire. And I put, I really programmed this. Um, so this was in joint work with Michael Fisher, um, who's at Manchester, Felix Lindner, who's at Freiburg, and Martin Moser Benson, who's at the Denmark Technological University. But as I put there, the existing programming error was all mine, and I didn't have anything to do with the other three people. Um, and in this particular piece of work, we were looking at an ethical reasoning principle called the principle of double effect, which is actually quite complicated. It has lots of subfits, but a kind of key thing is that A, the net balances of the consequences of an action must be positive. So you're scoring things, the outcomes of actions, a bit like you do in utilitarianism, and also that no negative consequences can be intended. And obviously what you mean by intended has a lot of philosophy behind it, but, but we were using it to mean, you know, anything that you had to do as part of the chain of things that happened in order to achieve the outcome you wanted. If it was a direct consequence of that thing, then that counted as an intended consequence. You knew that thing was going to happen and you knew that this was a consequence of that thing. So I'd um, encoded up my smart home like this. Um, I had some utilities. If the lights were on, that had a minus one utility. And that was to represent some kind of desire to be energy savings. If your lights are on, they're consuming resources, that's a bad thing. If the people leave the house, that also got minus one. And that was because, you know, it's disruptive if people leave the house. You don't want to be evacuating the house unnecessarily. And if people are safe, then you get a score of 10. So, you know, very, very important people are safe. And within the formalism we were using, and we had these things called mechanisms, which somehow represent the chains of events that can happen. So the first one is if you turn the lights on, then afterwards the lights will be on. Then if it, the lights are on or there is daylight, then people are able to see. If you attempt to evacuate the house and people can see, then the people will leave the house. If the people leave the house or there is no danger in the house, then the people are safe. Um, and if the, there is a fire, then there is danger in the house. So I plugged all this into the system. And this is almost the first thing I do is I try to prove that if there's a fire, then the system will try to evacuate the house. And it didn't. Um, and I think because I presented it like this, some of you may already see the problem. But I must have spent a day deep in the heart of the program for this system trying to figure out what I had done wrong in terms of actually programming how utilities were cal calculated and how intended consequences were calculated uh, and how the decision mechanism was working until I suddenly realized that the negative utilities for the lights being on and for the people leaving the house both counted as negative intended consequences and so they were genuinely being ruled out as potential things you could do in order to get people to safe. They were negative consequences. And so even though there was an overall net positive, the fact we had some intended negative outcomes meant that the principle of double effect um, meant that this was wrong. Um, I then got into an argument with Martin, who was the philosopher on the team, because he thought that there were ways to encode this differently, which meant it would work. I thought that the principle of double effect was a silly ethical reasoning system to use. Um, so that's kind of separate argument. But this is you know, really a very simple system. And it took me a long time to realize there was a bug here, um, or at least it was not capturing the ethics I wanted. And so that's why you may want to do some proof, because even where you've got a kind of explicit list of rules and your stakeholders are signed off on them, you can still have things that will go wrong. So broadly speaking, in the work we've done, I think that the properties of ethical reasoning systems fit into three categories. So one is um, checking that the underlying decision-making implementation is correct. So that was the mistake I thought I had made with the previous example. I thought I'd actually implemented the principle of double effect incorrectly. And so the kind of baseline code of my system was wrong. And broadly speaking, um, we tend to try and prove some kind of least worst option is always chosen. So we set up properties which say if you choose something that violates this thing it's because all other properties um, violate some even worse things. Then you've got what I'm calling sanity, sanity checking properties 
And these are things like overriding safety concerns. So that first property I plugged in in the case of the smart home, which was, you know, if there is a fire, then it will evacuate. That was just there, you know, throw in a property that definitely ought to be true, um, just to kind of check that nothing weird is going on. And other properties you might want to put in there is if you've got legal constraints on your system, you know what they are, no matter what the, the ethics are your stakeholders are signing off, you might have this separate category of things saying, no matter what else is going on with these rules, these things always get obeyed and you somehow pull them out separately as things you want to check that they hold in the system. And then lastly, I've what I've called um, scenario programming, probing. Um, and I think this is something that is true in um, lots of situations where you're trying to um, prove things about autonomous systems. The, the environments in which they are going to be operating are, are so underspecified and so uncertain that you're not sure you can capture everything, but you can set up a more constrained scenario where you say, well, suppose it's in this situation and these things are happening. And there's still maybe quite a lot of things that can happen, but you've got more of a handle on that scenario. And then you can set up some properties that are specific to that scenario and check that they hold within that scenario. So in this case, you can explore specific case studies and settings to check that the correct choice is made in those case studies and settings. And again, in the case of ethics, although philosophy may not be able to tell us what the right choice is in general, there are lots of domains and lots of settings where we have a whole load of, of human law and human understanding, which let us know what is the ethical thing to do in that situation. So we can narrow our proof down to somehow that situation and check that at least the right thing is happening there where we know what the right thing should be. Um, this next slide, I mean, I think techniques that are available to verification are probably very familiar to this, this audience, but just very briefly, um, you've got a program here and for the sake of argument, I'm representing this program as some kind of finite state machine. So you start here, you move via some internal program command to this state, there's some kind of choice here, you can go this way and it ends, or you can go down here where there's some kind of loop and finally it ends. And the sort of techniques we can choose to prove things about these programs is we have um, what we call theorem proving techniques. So we have some mathematical expression, phi. Phi is true before the program starts. And we have rules which tell us when you execute something, then in the next state, theta is going to be true. So if you do this thing and phi is true beforehand, afterwards theta will be true. And as you go through the program, you can work out what formulas hold at each step in the program. There's some quite fancy stuff that tends to happen as you go around loops and ultimately you get to a point where some formula psi hold. And the kind of theorem you're trying to prove is if phi is true at the start of the program, then psi is true at the end. Theorem proving is a hugely powerful technique. Um, it's very, very general. It tends to be very difficult to automate. So you tend to need um, skilled mathematicians or skilled verification engineers to actually apply um, theorem proving, but it can prove things at a high level of generality about how a program works. Um, testing is actually a valid technique. So you run um, the program on certain inputs and it will take a certain path through the program and you're generally asking is phi true at the end? So you have some criteria of whether you've got the correct answer out of the program and there are a whole load of techniques that allow you to try and explore the space of execution routes through the program as fully as possible, or make sure you've found the kind of interesting edge cases and that kind of thing, because bugs tend to happen at edge cases in programs. Um, the technique that we've used in our work on machine ethics is model checking. And I often describe model checking as exhaustive testing. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the idea is to make sure that you have, at some sense, explored all the paths that are through the program. Typically, when you use a model checker, you use, and it's called model checking, is you take a model of the program, you don't actually look at the program code itself. And that's for a variety of reasons, some to do with um, reducing the actual state space you have to explore. Model checking is an automated technique, so you have to worry about state space explosion. 
Um, and sometimes it's just that you have these tools for using model checking and they have an input language. And so you transform the program that you are actually going to run into the input language of this model checking machine, which may well not connect very well to underlying hardware or something like that in case of an autonomous system. Um, and so that's why you've got this model of your code rather than the actual code itself. We often use what's called program model checking, which is when you do exactly the same thing, but on the actual underlying code of the system. Um, and there are model checkers available for Java and C where you can do program model checking. They tend to be slower than the more abstract version, partly because they have to deal with the state space explosion. So we're talking about this kind of exhaustive path exploration technique um, applied to actual program code normally. And generally, when you're doing model checking, you have quite explicitly sort of temporal tr properties. So we tend to have properties of the form of if phi is true, then eventually psi will be true. And so that means if it's kind of some point as you go through the path of the program, you reach a point when phi is true, then eventually as you go through the program at some end state, psi will be true. So what we do with autonomous systems and the machine ethics is we generally have a decision making component or module within the system and we simply apply model checking to that decision making component. Um, and that's partly because I and mean, we've looked to quite a lot of robotic systems which tend to be quite modular anyway. Um, and it's partly to control the state space explosion. So generally what we tend to look at is considering all the possible data that could come in and we don't generally try to do any, this is the data that's likely to come in. We look at all possible combinations of data that might come in. Does, as this decision maker processes that data and then sends out a system command, does it send out the right command? So we have data comes in from sensors. We have this decision maker and then it outputs some execution command to the rest of the system. And this is a, a declarative explicit decision maker generally. So it's a set of rules. Um, it's, it's not a kind of statistical neural net. So for instance, here's a very simple one. It's got two rules. If you believe there's an obstacle, then stop. And if you believe there is a path, then follow it. And so the perceptions that might come in, and we've abstracted these two predicates. Um, so they are, there is an obstacle or there is no obstacle and there is a path or there is no path. And the model checker makes sure we explore all combinations of these in this really simple case. Either there is no obstacle and no path, or there is an obstacle and no path, or there is no obstacle and there is a path, or there is an obstacle and there is a path. It plugs into these rules and it will um, pass out a command. And so we've got here the property we're trying to prove is if the agent believes there is an obstacle, then it will try to stop. And obviously in this case, it's irrelevant. There's no obstacle. In this case, there's an obstacle. This rule activates and it stops. In this case, there's no obstacle, so it's irrelevant. And this rule, well, obviously, it's going to depend how it combines these two rules together, whether it obeys this property or not. So that's the kind of um, um, system we've been looking at. And generally, the errors we find are when lots of things are happening at once, this kind of obstacle path situation. So um, the first set of properties I talked about were these ones where you're checking your implementation is correct. Um, this one, it was a, a system that was um, supposed to be trying to get a robot to intervene with a human. It was in danger and we actually did some validation on these little now robots. As you can see, there were a whole lot of stuff that can go wrong with these robots, which has nothing to do with the decision making. Um, so that was a little video from one of the trial situations. But this um, work was published um, in a paper called On Proactive, Transparent and Verifiable Ethical Reasoning for Robots. And it was joint work I did with Michael Fisher from Manchester and Paul Bremner and Alan Winfield from Bristol Robotics Lab. And what we've done here is we actually, although I said earlier that you should not, that you know, Asimov's laws of robots are inadequate, we'd actually tried to program these in as the reasonings um, for the robots. So the idea was of the setup was 
that we had two robots. One of them was a human and one of them was a robot. The robot had been ordered to go towards a goal and there was a dangerous area which was um, sort of represented by markings in the arena that we were, were looking at. And so the robot's job was to keep the human out of the danger area, to go towards its goal and not to get into danger itself. And it could keep the human out of the danger area by moving to intercept the human and get into their way. So we had this um, implementation where we had the kind of standard robot controller, which looks at what its goals are and moves towards its goals. Um, and up here, we had an ethical layer, which would do a little bit of simulation, looking ahead in time a bit to see what would happen in the arena that it was in, in the next 10 seconds or so. And for this, it was using some predictions. So for instance, here we have the human robot and it's predicting that the human might enter this danger area here if the human continues on their current course. And so that might prompt the robot to try and intercept them. Um, it has an ethical decision module. So it gets sent by the underlying robot controller some possible actions it might take and it's supposed to pick the most acceptable, but it was allowed to say none of these actions are acceptable. For instance, if the robot just carried on towards its goal, that's location B here, the human would walk towards A and fall into this kind of orange hole. And so it can then has its own planner module where it can extract some new choices um, in order to get a better, better ethical outcome. And the kind of verification we did here was this kind of, have we actually implemented this right? So in terms of um, our model checking, we had three very abstract tasks. And what we searched over was how the tasks related to each other in terms of astronauts and um, laws of robotics. So we had these three um, orderings. So less than HD means that task two puts the human in less danger, in more danger than task one. So task two is worse than task one in terms of how much danger the human ends up in. Here, RO are the orders given to the robot. So that is, um, uh, that's the have you obeyed the orders given you to by the human. So, so task one is um, worse than task two um, if it's more contrary to the human, the, the robot's orders. And this one, RD, is you know, similarly, does it put the robot in more danger than the other task? Um, so we've got here a property um, which says, um, I don't know, a second, I'm just losing confidence in my property. Uh, if the current, the current one we've picked is task one, then our perception is that task one is better than task two in terms of how much danger the humans is, even if it was worse in terms of the robot's orders or putting the robot in danger. I say I've lost confidence in that property. I may have written it down wrong. Ignore what I've actually written there. But the idea is that you've, oh, if you've picked task one, if it's worse in terms of the robot's orders and how much danger the robot is in, then that is because the other task was worse in terms of how much danger the human was put in. And that reflects this ordering in Asimov's laws of robotics. So the idea is you've picked the least worst option. Um, one thing we also tried to prove um, was that it definitely picked one of the three tasks. So we were just looking at three possible tasks and we had all possible orderings between the tasks in terms of our three orders. And we tried to show that in all of them, the one picked was either because it was the best in terms of all three, or the ones it violated were not as bad as the one it was obeying. But we also said eventually it will pick either task one or task two or task three. And that failed very quickly the first time we put it into the model checker. And that was because if you've looked over all possible orderings, then you got kind of loops and things. You know, task one is better than task two in terms of human danger, and task two is better than task three in terms of human danger, and task three is better than task one in terms of human danger, so you've got kind of loop there. So we discovered that quite quickly that we could only prove this if we assumed that all the relations were transitive. And we then went back and looked at what we'd implemented um, and did some actually quite traditional pen and paper type proofs 
to try and show that the, the reasoning, that the, the orderings that were in the code were transitive. And we found a bug there. We found actually the, that one of the, the ways we were judging um, the distance to the robot and whether the robot distance between the human and the danger and the human, the robot actually generated a non transitive relation. So this kind of approach did actually find as a bug in our underlying implementation. Moving on to sanity checking properties, I've already talked a bit about them in my case of the smart home that wouldn't evacuate in the case of a fire. Um, so this is what we call the Juno system. Um, this is actually unpublished work, but um, the code is out there on GitHub. Um, so this, this, the MacApple system is our general framework for verifying properties of agent programming languages, which are what we're using as the decision makers at the heart of these autonomous systems. And one of these languages is called Juno. So if you really want to go and look, you can find test cases and example files and a whole field of things related to the Juno system. And Juno is built on top of Hera, which is an ethical reasoning system, which was created by Martin and Felix, who were two of the people we were working with in that smart um, home example. So we have a Hera agent, which is their system. And what we did here was we have some perceptions come in from the outside world. We had a little bit of inference happening on those perceptions, which was in terms of generating the information that's of interest to these mechanisms that are within their system. We had a concept that sometimes the kind of encoding might update and the paper which is currently submitted to AAAI is all about how these, these models might update, might change and how that affects the verification and the reasoning. This goes into the HERA agent which decides what to do and there's a bit of cleanup afterwards. And the kind of properties we were checking there, as I say, one was, you know, if we believe there's a fire, then eventually um, the system will evacuate the home. And this D is for it does, it does an evacuation action. Um, we also looked at an example which was to do with delivering messages and notifications, which could be marked either public or private. And so one of the properties we looked at there was it's always the case that if you believe you have a private message, then eventually you'll believe you've delivered it and there were no visitors present at the time. So you've only delivered the private message in private, you've not delivered it at any point where other people might hear the system um, read out this message, or it was all it's been the case that you couldn't deliver the message. And these are kind of, as it were, sanity checking pro properties. So you imagine you've got a whole load of rules in these systems and you're checking that, that under certain circumstances, certain decisions are always made. Um, scenario probing. Um, here I'm going to talk about one of the very early um, pieces of verification of ethical reasoning we did. So this is joint work of, again, Michael Fisher and my, myself with Maria Slavkovich, who was a PDRA working with us then, but she's now at the University of, Ber of Bergen in Norway, and Matt Webster, also PDRA, and he's now at Liverpool John Moores University. Um, and we looked there at actually kind of examples of all these different kinds of properties. So we didn't really, weren't really beginning to separate them out into a sort of taxonomy at that point. Um, and we looked at them in the context of previous work that Michael and Matt had done in conjunction with Darsbury Labs in Warrington um, about implementing the rules of the air. So they had done a system where they had one of these agent based reasoning components um, that was going to be inside um, an unmanned aircraft. And the idea was to prove that this component would always obey the rules of the, of the air, which are a set of rules that human pilots um, flying in UK airspace are expected to um, obey. And something that had come up while um, Matt and Michael were talking to the Civil Aviation Authority about this was they had said, but what happens when the rules of the air have to be broken. And it turned out that there was this concept that a human pilot would break the rules of the air if there was some overriding ethical reason to do so. For instance, to obey the rules of the air would result in the loss of human life. So we were looking at some examples in, in that um, system. And so we came up with an ethical reasoning system based on a theory of someone called Ross which is called prima facie duties. And these have been used in other ethical reasoning systems. So 
the idea of prima facie duty is, is that we have a set of ethical concerns which we rank. So we say that, for instance, killing is worse than stealing and stealing is worse than lying. And we have a set of plans which have been annotated in some way, some magical way, with the ethical concerns that they violate. And so our ethical choice mechanism was that a plan P1 is worse than another P2 if P1 violates any ethical concern and P2 doesn't violate any ethical concerns. If you're not violating ethical concerns, you're automatically better than any plan that violates some ethical concern. Then because we've got this rank, if the worst concern violated by P2 and not by P1 is less serious than the worst concern violated by P1 and not by P2. So you're rank there, ranking them in order if they're, if they're violating ethical concerns, you prefer the plan which violates the, the least serious concerns. And lastly, if all the worst concerns are equally bad, but P1 violates more concerns than P2 does, then you prefer P2 to P1. So we implemented this system um, and in particular, um, we were looking at only invoking ethics in what we called unforeseen circumstances. So we had this concept that in general, you've engineered your system to be implicitly ethical in the way of that example I was looking at right at the start of um, Facebook. So you've done a whole load of other work and decided this will always make the right choices. But because you're in this dynamic, uncertain, under, under specified environment, sometimes things go wrong. So it may be that your, your planning system for what to do can't send you a plan. It says, I've got no available plans. And so you might want to go out to some other system, maybe some kind of complex machine learning system that will do something you don't fully understand and it will send you an option back annotated with ethical concerns. Um, another option might be that you've tried the plans you're giving and they don't seem to be making the situation any better. You've got some kind of monitoring of the situation you're in, in which case, again, you might say, OK, let's try something different. And you go out to this, this more uncertain system to see what it can suggest for you. So in terms of this sort of scenario probing, one we looked at was that we had this um, um, set of ethical concerns. So our most um, important concern, the one ranked four, is that you should not collide with a manned aircraft. There are lots of people on a manned aircraft. You'll potentially hurt a lot of people. So that's the most important ethical concern. The next most important one is not to collide with individual people who are moving around an airport space. The next one is not to collide with airport hardware. And lastly, is um, the least important concern is not to damage this particular unmanned aircraft. Um, and we had a little scenario where the aircraft is um, lined up, um, about to take off. So we haven't, we're not even flying at the moment, this unmanned aircraft. It's taxiing towards the takeoff point and something goes wrong with it. It breaks so it can't stop. If it turns left, it's going to damage the aircraft and some airport hardware, but it's not going to hurt anybody. If it turns right, it's going to damage the aircraft and there's a risk that it will collide with some airport workers. Um, and lastly, if it continues in a straight line, well, there's the aircraft that's supposed to take off before it, which is a manned aircraft, and that's directly in front of it. So in this case, the correct decision is that it should turn left. So we've got always it's the case that it does turn left. And that we've predetermined is the correct choice in this circumstance. And we're trying to see if the rules and the encoding we've set up in this particular scenario result in that choice, which it was a very simple scenario. There wasn't even you know, much choice about what might happen here. So it very quickly said, yes, it always turns left. Um, something else you can do with scenario programming, um, scenario probing is it lets you evaluate risks, which is something that kind of philosophical ethical theories in general don't really handle. They tend to assume that if you do this, this thing will definitely happen. They're not so good at the, if you do this, there is a high risk that this will happen or there is a low risk that this will happen. Um, so again, this is based on work of Alan Wingfield and it's this same scenario where you have a human and you have a robot and the human is walking towards some danger. This is um, some previous work before he was dealing with the nows. Um, there's two humans here and they are walking towards a danger, which is this square on the ground 
And this little robot here is desperately trying to stop them. It's completely failed to stop them. Alan did a whole load of experiments. Um, and I tend to always play this um, video, which is where there are two humans and they confuse the little robot decision maker. So he can't, he managed to save one in this run through, but the other ones ended up in the square hole and failed this time to, uh, to rescue anybody and so on. And so Alan verified this one by just running a lot of experiments and working out how often the robot managed to save a human and how often it failed to save any of the humans. He did that with empirical uh, verification, just running it lots of time to say how likely this was to work. We tried to do some more formal verification here. And so this is a workshop paper that we did with Alan Winfield towards verifiably ethical robot behavior. And so in that case, we came up with a little um, abstraction of the environment. You've got a hole in the middle here, the black square, You've got two humans, H1 and H2, who at random take a step towards the hole. You have the robot R and you have some goal which the robot would is trying to get to if it's not got this overriding ethical imperative to try and intercept one of the humans. And the first thing we did was kind of traditional model checking. We showed that if the robot can find a safe path to the human when it believes the human is in danger, then the human won't fall into the hole. And that business about being able to find a safe path was sometimes there was just no way it could get to the human in time without going through the hole itself. And then it would fall in the hole and it wasn't able to rescue the human because it had already smashed itself in the hole. So, and we explored all options over this grid. But one thing that our tool lets us do is we can out, our tool explores the space of the program that we're model checking but as part of exploring that space, it converts it into a finite automata representation of the program. So we can then export that finite automata rep um, representation and import it into any other model checking tool that uses finite automata. Um, and PRISM is a model checking tool that um, actually allows you to have probabilities of transitions between states in your automata. So we modified our tool a little bit so it could annotate the edges with the probabilities of certain things happening. And so then we had um, a probability that each human would take a step towards the whole, and then we were able to calculate the overall probability that the human would eventually fall in the hole. And I view this as, as I say, a kind of scenario program. We set up quite a specific situation here. There's some uncertainty in what's going to happen, but it's not a kind of free form trying to explore anything the robot might do um, in any kind of situation. I'd like to say that a whole load of um, issues remain, um, quite apart from the, you know, our approach is a model checking approach, and you might want to look at a theorem proving approach or a simulation test-based testing approach. Um, so one is I called situational awareness. So all our system does is we start with a all the information that might come in and it comes in as predicates of belief. Well, there's a whole load of stuff that has to happen between the senses of an autonomous system and that description in logical terms of the situation you're in. And if your robot cannot detect that a human might be in danger, then you're never going to be taking that action to rescue the human. So there's a whole gap there in terms of matching a situation into a description of the ethics of the situation that you might then be able to reason about. And some of that may just be standard um, automated reasoning type stuff that we're going to, you know, things like, you know, how does your image classifier work correctly? But some of it might be quite specific to how do you match some particular situation you um, find yourself in into the sort of terms that your ethical theory talks about. So particularly if you're doing something like virtue ethics, where you're kind of talking about, is this the honorable action to take? Is this the dignified action to take? Mapping some particular situation into this, how does this relate to the concept of honor? How does this relate to the concept of dignity? Is, you know, a, 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 there's a kind of big gap there, which A, needs to be fulfilled, and in terms, both in terms of implementation and in terms of verification. I've also put, um, Philosophical particularism, this is an ethical theory, but that does state that every single situation where you have to make an ethical choice is different. The, 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 the choice is particular to that situation, so you have to somehow make your choice 
in the moment of that situation. And I'm going to hand wave here because I'm not a philosopher, but you know, that means your whole problem with the ethics is, is a much bigger kind of issue. Um, I put here the concept of driving with due care and attention. So I've not mentioned um, trolley problems, which are the sort of most popular version of ethical reasoning in autonomous systems. So this is this issue of an autonomous car, its brakes have, fall, uh, have failed, there's a, I don't know, a nun on the left and a baby on the right, which one should it hit? And these, has, these have really captured the popular imagination. Actually, most ethicists think they are a bit of a dead end in terms of actually talking in a, a kind of really proper principled way about machine ethics. But what you do have with autonomous vehicles is, you know, at this point where your brakes fail, were you driving so fast that if a child stepped out in front of you, you would inevitably hit them? And we have this concept in law of driving with due care and attention. And obviously what we want to know about these, these, these vehicles ethically is, is were they driving with due care and attention? And I think there is work that can be done then, both in terms of formalizing what we mean by driving with due care and attention. I think we might be able to come up with a, a formal description of that. And then how do you actually go about proving that some of these systems, that is what they're doing? And the last thing which I've not touched on is what I've called sensitivity analysis and algorithmic bias. Algorithmic bias is a massive topic in AI and ethics. It's this issue of if the, the data and the environment in which your algorithm operates is inherently biased against certain groups, then often your decision making is going to magnify that bias and magnify the, her the harm. And machine ethics up till now has not really had much to say about that. Most of the approaches to mitigating that are about process, they're about how have you collected the data, who are your stakeholders, who have you, cons have you consulted, what might the harms be if this is wrong. So they're about these much um, more social science questions and the much more formal end, the verification end, hasn't really focused its attention on can we do anything in this area. And maybe we can't, but I feel it's a big unexplored area um, that I think we ought to, from a formal point of view, be able to say some things about. So that's my kind of final slide of, of things I don't think we're even touching on in this area yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's thank uh, Dennis, uh, Luis, uh, sorry. And uh, well, I don't know uh, how to uh, simulate the, the act of uh, <laughs> thanking the, the speaker. But I, I will imagine was... you all clapping. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, but uh, this was an excellent kickoff of our um, first talk for, for, the, for the, the whole talk series, I think. And these are very fascinating uh, questions that we'll deal with throughout the, the coming three and a half years in this project. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. There is this hand button. Um, so if you look down your screen, there is this hand button where you can raise your hand and then I can give the floor to you to, to ask your question. Until the first question uh, arises, I could ask a question to kick off the discussion. So you mentioned a couple of very interesting semantic phenomena that, that were necessary to describe the different ethical concerns. One was some sort of um, priority or comparison among different types of actions. The other thing I saw was uh, the concept of belief. So, so uh, whether a certain agent believes that something is true, that that's another semantic concern that uh, you mentioned. Is there any inventory of those semantic constructs that are necessary to to codify to formalize different different ethical theories um not really i mean the fact that we use belief a lot um well it's an artifact partly of the type of programming languages we've tended to use to program these up which have been in general in the beliefs desires intentions theory so belief is a kind of first class construct in those languages um i think it's quite useful in the concept of these reasoners in autonomous systems because it represents a description of the situation the system has found itself in which it has abstracted somehow from the sensor data so it's not quite as certain as a fact or a piece of knowledge um, but i don't think beliefs are 
so codifying things in terms of beliefs unnecessary in terms of verifying things about machine ethics that just happens to be the sort of languages we've gone down um I forgot what your first example was. So the the other concept I saw was a kind of a priority or, or uh, the priorities. So so quite a lot of these ethical systems do have these somehow concepts of of, of sets of rules with priorities. Um, so then you can do this. You know, it always picks the least worst option. Um, or I suppose I mean, if you were trying to do something with utilitarianism, then you'd say, well, it always picks the option with the best score but that's not necessary so for instance if you've got something like um Kant's categorical imperative then that's just a, a, a simple prohibition there's no kind of it doesn't then kind of um give you any sign of um hierarchy between the acceptable and the unacceptable actions it just says these ones are all unacceptable these ones are acceptable um, and in fact, when we were doing this kind of smart home example with the hero system, because the hero system in, encodes several different ethical theories, so you can have fun watching them make different choices. Um, um, the categorical imperative, at the point we wanted the system to do something, it just kind of said, well, all these things are fine. Uh, and so we ended up then plugging it into a utilitarian reasoner to pick one of those. But we could have picked one at random. Um, and or we could have had some kind of much more traditional autonomous system to say, right, well, all these things are acceptable. I'm going to do my normal kind of goal based reasoning or whatever it is I do to pick one. So one of the problems you do have is these systems are. These theories are quite heterogeneous um, and we don't yet, I think. Well, I haven't seen a kind of really clear taxonomy or kind of unifying theory of how you can go about um, doing this or even knowing that you're kind of comparing these different implementations and systems on the same terms you know you're even talking about the same sorts of things so i think there's a kind of whole space there if you look at these survey papers you know there's kind of a lot of stuff but there's not a kind of a lot of unifying stuff yet so there is a lot of room for us to do yes research. uh ivan you had a question i see your hand raised yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'll uh, make myself visible. So, um, I've well, in some sense, I would like to follow up from from your question, Mohammed. Uh, so, uh, well, it can be at least represented that way. Uh, so, okay, beliefs uh, and uncertainty. So, like, let me uh, uh, put this uh, well uh, down, uh, probably shorter. So, so um, in in these scenarios which uh, we discussed. Uh, uh, I, I sort of sensed that the uh, bias is to, you know, create a set of rules uh, which, uh, well, we can understand and then assess uh, and uh, determine, uh, uh, you know, uh, usefulness or the correctness of the uh, specific algorithm or a program. However, um, when, when uncertainties are brought in, let's say in terms of beliefs or some other, uh, uh, you know, variables, uh, uh, well, we are now going probably to face the following dilemma. So, uh, well, what about if we, what about these deterministic rules being swapped uh, by um, like randomized uh, decisions? And like, uh, for example, uh, like consider a situation which you um, uh, already mentioned and described where you've got like some uh, loop reasoning and it would be it was difficult to uh, to determine uh, what to do. However, uh, like in many game situations, uh, this sort of uh, um, you know more movements and motions in the decision space could be circumvented by uh, uh, associating a, a probability measure to a given action. So in a way, randomization enables you to overcome that situation. And uh, so my question is then, since we are talking about uncertainties uh, and we are plugging them in the into the rules and the the system so like how ethical from your perspective would be to you know uh, fully accept them maybe a probabilistic or like randomized uh, approach uh, in algorithms uh, uh, to to deliver the same task i i understand like from the ethical perspective i don't want to to, to flip coins uh, and like i want to be everything explainable and and you know um, reliable and uh, transparent However, if there is uncertainty already, 
So uh, wouldn't it be, you know, uh, you know, a case for these randomized algorithms and how ethical these randomized algorithms, in your opinion, can be? Thank you. OK, so there's quite a lot of stuff to unpack there. Um, so, so one is that I think, as I mentioned in passing, I don't think philosophy has had a, well, philosophical ethics has really dealt with uncertainty. So um, the kind of classic theories, well, you say, OK, you say that, you know, um, um, killing, but causing death is bad. But, you know, if my options are uh, a one in a million chance someone will die versus a uh, um, one in 10 chance that um, 20 people will have their legs broken. You know, some, some kind of choice like that then most people would probably say, well, we'll rev take the risk that someone will die to avoid, you know, injuring lots of people. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, philosophy hasn't caught up with that, which means that's all completely open. And so you get into this much more, well, what do we think would be acceptable? And then you get into the, um, who do you consult issue? This, this whose ethics are you trying to capture? Who do you consider to be the stakeholders? Um, and something that's happened with quite a lot of these algorithmic bias systems is that the people who've designed the system and who've been trying to decide what's acceptable have not been the people who the systems have been deployed at. So for instance, um, uh, facial recognition systems used by police forces, designed by white people who think it's a terribly good idea to be able to identify criminals in crowds, developed on databases of white people, quite good at distinguishing white people's faces, can't tell the difference between black people's faces. And anyway, black people have quite a very different idea about this kind of surveillance technology, which is going to be deployed more in their neighborhoods than it is going to be in white neighborhoods, but they were not consulted. Um, and so the ethics of what was acceptable that was captured um, was not that that was, so there's a whole load of stuff going on there. Am I, am I still, everyone's frozen, so is everyone still No, we, we, we can hear you perfectly, there is no problem. Okay. We are only reaching the limit of our time, so we have only two minutes oh, okay. left. I know I there are lots of questions, and interestingly, hmm. there are other nodes actually in the same program that have also philosophers on board. So I know Trust Node, I think Hannah is here from the Trust Node, they have philosophers on board who could also engage in this discussion and provide some very interesting feedback. So let's hope that we can also invite them at a certain moment and then listen to them and, 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 and interact with them about. And then I think I think with this kind of randomized thing, then there's also a, um, yes, there might be a point where you're deciding along a whole load of bad options, and you might want to do something like flip a coin. You might say these all look equally bad, or the uncertainty is so high that I can't make an ethical decision here. So I'm going to make some kind of random decision here and that might be part of your ethics and that might be something acceptable. You might even decide there are situations where you don't want the system to have all the information. So like this nun and baby example, do you actually want your autonomous vehicle to be saying, oh, that one's a nun, whereas that one I've just looked in the police database and realized it's a criminal, therefore clearly I'm going to run over the criminal. You know, this is presumably information you don't even want the system to have in order to make its decision. These are just two people it's going to have to hit one. Maybe it should flip a coin. Um, so there are definitely situations where I think genuine non-determinism into the decision-making process might be the way you you kind of break some of these thorny problems. Particularly if you're in a hurry. There's only there's limited information ava available. You don't know what the risks are. You don't know what the uncertainties are. You don't know what the outcomes are with any certainty. Toss a coin. Might well be the best thing you can do. Yeah, well, I think, Louisa, yeah, that yeah. was a perfect yeah. answer. And, and like, if, if I may just praise your first answer to, to my question, I think you're absolutely right. The human philosoph philosoph philosophical ethics hasn't caught quite up with the demands of the task we are trying to solve. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Louise, once again, for this very interesting talk. I think it provoked lots of thoughts and, and there are lots of interesting questions to, to pursue. Uh, just a brief announcement. We already have the next speaker on the 29th of October. Jim Woodcock will talk about the unifying semantic uh, framework for, for autonomous systems. Oh, sorry, for verifiability. I'm really sorry, Jim. Um, and if you would like to receive future announcements, please subscribe to this mailing list. I've, I've 
uh, sent a message on the chat box. So if you send an email to this mailing list, you will be uh, uh, subscribing to our public announcements and, and you will receive the future talk, talk announcements there. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Louise. It was a very interesting talk and thank you all for being here. I think it was a very good uh, participation for, for the first talk. We had about 30 people uh, and I think there are now 28 or 29 still in the call. So thank you uh, all for being here and see you in two weeks for Jim Woodcock's talk. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you, Mohammed. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mohamed. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Uh, bye. Thanks, Mohamed. Bye. So, Jan, if you don't mind, I will download this and put it some... Oh, Jan has left. Okay, that's okay. I'll chat with him later.